بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين Some definitions. And we said that throughout your learning, you are going, you are going to come across terms that it is very important, and we repeat this many times, to make a distinction between the linguistic meaning of a word and the technical meaning which it gets in every science which you study. To one word, they might be more than one technical meaning. To <coughs> one word, they might be more than one technical meaning. As you saw and witnessed from the word sunnah yesterday, for example. So sunnah has more than one technical meaning. Sunnah could be used to express that which is preferred. Sunnah could be used as well to express the general way of the Prophet Sallallahu And this is besides its linguistic meaning, which means the general way of anything, anyway. So it is very important. We stress this always. We, and I know we repeat this much, and you have heard it many times before. But you have to um, fix this back in your mind that Every term you will take, you have to relate it back to its linguistic meaning. Because this will even help you with the definitions that you're going to learn later in books of fiqh. Not only in books of fiqh, but also in other sciences, but especially books of fiqh. Because the definition might affect the ruling. The definition might affect the ruling. And you're going to take some rulings to some things, for example, um, as zina What is a zina There is a difference between the scholars in the definition of a zina So they say, for example, uh, some scholars say zina is uh, uh, that a that a, uh, 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 a sane adult Muslim has intercourse with. Or, or has intercourse, some of them mentioned in the definition uh, that this, whoever he had intercourse with, is supposed to be someone uh, who is, yeah, I mean, of course they call it mushtaha. And mushtaha means someone who is desired to have intercourse with. So some of them consider that which is not desired to have intercourse with, like if it was a very, very small girl, they don't consider it ozina. And this leads to a difference in ruling. Is his punishment going to be the prescribed punishment that was mentioned, or a general punishment which the, uh, the ruler sees and, and afflicts? So it is very important for you to know that the definitions are based upon all the technical definitions are based upon their technical meanings. And basically this means that the technical meaning is the linguistic meaning and more. And more to it. More descriptions to it, more conditions to it, as we have clarified yesterday. So yesterday, for example, we said that the linguistic meaning of a sunnah is the way, the way, which way, any general way, unspecified, but technically it is the way of someone in particular, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, see, so you add to the definition of the Prophet, that definition changed the first meaning, how did it change it, it specified it, well then, 
And this will aid you to know the technical meaning, if, even if you didn't know it. Even if you didn't know the technical meaning, what the technical meaning was, and you had a linguistic meaning, you could know it through the linguistic meaning, and vice versa. If you didn't have the linguistic meaning, you could know it through the what? The technical meaning, and so on. Okay? Now today, of course, we said we are going to go again through the uh, important lessons of Asaf, and we're going to follow this time this book, which is Tasrif al Okay? Have you found this book in the stores or? Who found this book? I said, we got it. At the book fair. At the book fair, okay. Who found this book? Of course, this book you can get it at Dubai Library. Dubai Library? Yes. Because there are the distributors. Tasrif. Tasrif is this. It's the same book we're doing online. It's the same book we're doing online. Tasrif al Izzi. It's the same book we're doing online. He said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa bihi nasta'een, Rabbi tamim bil khayr. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahim ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidi Rabbi Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Of course, this, the introduction, we're not going to explain those words because we're going to explain it in fact, insha'Allah, when we come to it. So he says, first, i'lam anna tasrifa fi lughati al-taghir. Now he's going to explain to you what the word sub means. Okay? Now, it is important to you, before you start learning any science, especially the Islamic sciences, that you at least know the definition. What is the science, the reality of the science? What is it? And there are ten things you should know before any knowledge. Ten things. And those ten things are the definition, and the subject, the topic, and the benefit, and the ruling, and the name, and the source, the source from which it is taken, from which this knowledge is taken, and it, its relationship with the other, with the yani, or, or to which type of knowledge does it belong to. Okay? Uh, some of them even gathered it in a poem. It's merit. The one who invented it, or the one who originated it. And also, uh, and the ruling of learning it. What is a ruling? Is it one of the things that are obligatory upon each and every individual? Or is it based upon sufficiency? If some do it, the rest don't have to do it. So, there are ten things that are good to know before entering any type of knowledge. Okay? But, a lot of scholars, they just mention one of those things, which is the definition. But it, it is good to know the definition, four of those ten things. The definition, the fruit and the benefit of learning such a science, and the ruling and the topic, the subject. Okay? So first of all, we're going to take the definition. What is the definition of what we are going to learn, which is called Hassan? Hassan. And you can say also, according to Azidin Zinjani, you can say also at Tasrif. So you can say Asaf or at Tasrif. Both give the same technical meaning. Meaning they give this name, they call this knowledge this name and this name as well. That's a technical meaning. So you can say 
see itself, and you can see it doesn't. Okay, let's focus on self. Self, linguistically, these root letters, which are the Sad and the Ra and the Fa, they circulate around two main means, two general means. The first one is changing. And the second one is turning. Changing or turning. Focus on turning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Saraf Allah qulubahum. Saraf Allah qulubahum. Yani Allah turned away their hearts. So sarafa means turning. This, the meaning of asaf is what? <coughs> turning. This is in which? Which meaning? Linguistic. Very good. This is the linguistic meaning. So if you know that the linguistic meaning to the word asaf is turning, can you try to guess in general the technical meaning? Hmm. Yes, yes, a specific turning, that's right. Because we said the difference between the technical meaning and the linguistic meaning is that the linguistic is general and the technical is So, in general, sarf is a specific turning. Okay? So, here, in this knowledge, you are going to turn something into many things. Okay? So, self linguistically is what? Turning. Okay, technically, it is turning. The root word into different forms. in order to express different or <coughs> in order to express certain meanings
before being in sentences words before being in sentences words before being in where sentences there are two sciences of linguistics one includes or studies the word before being placed into a sentence before you put it together in a sentence then there's another science which studies the word after being placed in a sentence the first one it studies the word individually that means it tells you how to build the word and say it correctly how to say it correctly that means it teaches you how to say I did how to say you did how to say she did how to say they did etc and this is one word <coughs> a single word okay some of it is a single word then the other science which you which you're not learning here is when you know the correct word to use only then can you form what sentences forming sentences is another subject that we're going to take which is grammar this is not grammar this is what is called in English morphology so morphology studies what it studies the single word the word individually what words to use this is what is most important especially for the non-arabs okay because the, the arabs already have the words they have the vocab much of the vocabulary that's why it is better for them especially in those days to start with grammar it might be better for them although I have a different point of view I say that sub is always the most important the classical way the way they used to do it is they used to start with a sub because you putting sentences together depends on you knowing what words to put together if you don't even know the words before you put them together, how would you form a correct sentence, let, 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 let alone forming the, or using the correct words? Well then, this is from an aspect. From another aspect, if you want to learn grammar easily, then sarf is your starting point. So if you know sarf, every other yani, uh, Arabic science will become very easy for you. Okay? Now, it says, Saf is turning the root word into different forms in order to express certain meanings which aren't expressed except through their own forms. What does this all mean? Here, is this written? Everyone has written this? Okay. <coughs> Now, what do we mean by the definition that we have given you? The root word. The root word we call in Arabic Masdar. The root word. You can say the mother word, the word that from which many forms will branch out is called what? Masdar. Masdar is what is referred to in English as the verbal noun. Masdar. The root word 
or the mustar is what is referred to as the verbal noun. The, the verbal noun in Arabic is called masdar. What does it mean, the verbal noun? Hmm. In English, the verbal noun. It is the name given to the act itself. The process, the action itself. Regardless of the time. Regardless of the time frame. That act could be done in the past, could be done in the future, could be done at present. Regardless the time frame, the act itself, doing the act itself, the practicing of the act itself, this is the verbal noun. Okay? Like eating, drinking, walking, talking, explaining, writing, listening, etc. Clear? Is this clear? So the verbal noun is clear? Okay, let's move to the second one. So this is the verbal noun. Let's give you an example in Arabic. Of course, the common example they use is but. But. What does but mean? Hitting. Hitting. Bab is the act of hitting. When? No time frame. Regardless of the time frame. There's no time frame involved. Hitting. The hitting itself. We say in Arabic what? Bab. Okay? This. Or let's give you other examples. Um, Someone is intaking food. What do you call that? Aklun. Of course, eating in English. We say in Arabic. Aklun. Someone is intaking water or liquids. Uh -huh. Drinking. We say shogun. Someone is taking steps, step after step. What do you call that in English? Walking. Walking. The act of walking. That's the verbal noun. In Arabic, we say meshyun. So, aknun, shurbun, meshyun. These are examples. We're going to work on that. Okay? This they have called Masdar. Why? Because Masdar linguistically means the source. Masdar linguistically means the source. Linguistically. They have called this a Masdar due to it being the source of all words. Of all different forms. And I'll explain to you I know you don't understand now what you mean by forms. Now, you have hitting. Regarding the meaning hitting, there are many ways you want to express this meaning. Sometimes you want to express that the act of hitting was done by yourself in the past. Correct? Sometimes you wish to change. You have another meaning that is a bit different than the first. Sometimes you wish to speak about an individual who did the act of hitting but in the present. Sometimes you want to express how many times, how many hits you have received. Sometimes you want to express multiple hits. Sometimes you want to express a person who is hitting. Other times, a person who received the beating. So those are all different meanings, but they go back to the main meaning, which is what? Okay. Which is hitting. Okay? Now, I, I need your help now. 
I want you to make up any meaning that you wish to express in Arabic depending on the meaning you're hitting. Any meaning. In English. A tool, a, a tool. Okay, no, that's a bit difficult. Let's try something simple. I hit. Huh? I hit. No, in, in, I hit. You want to say I hit? Okay. I hit. I hit you. You, you mean in the past, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any meaning? Any meaning you wish to express in Arabic? The person. Say it in English. The person. Doing and I'll write it down. The person. The one hitting. Yes. Yes, please. Any meaning you wish to express? Yes. The hitter. The hitter. That's the hitter. The one hitting. The one who got it. The one who got it. Beautiful. The one being hit. Yes. She, she, None? She got hit. She, 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 got hit. she got hit? Okay, fine. She got hit. Yes. Yes. It's okay, just keep it here because. No. It is not only physical, it means means another way. Uh -huh. What way he talks is his in the brain. What way is. This is another, not physically hit your brain, it's different. What, what do you mean, okay, what do you mean it hit my brain? That means it crossed your mind? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, tempted my brain. Ah, there, then there, when you say in English it hit my brain, yeah. although they don't say that in English, but let's say, if you say it hit my brain in English, okay, that's, is that a, 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 a literal meaning or a metaphor, metaphorical one? And now we're speaking about the, what the literal meanings. So it's okay, it's correct, and we have uh, such a usage in Arabic, but now we mean the, the literal meaning of hitting. Using that word for it, used for it. But, but we have such a usage in Arabic. But give me a meaning now that you wish to convey from hitting. Yes, you. Yeah. So which I uh, say something is uh, hijab or I tempted what which way he talks hijab my brain or I tempted uh, No no let, let's let's uh, stay away from the metaphorical meanings. Let's say any meaning you wish to express from hitting besides the metaphorical meanings. The actual hitting. The hard hitter. Any him please. Any meaning, any So he's a very hard hitter. Some plain, something plain no? that he He's not hitting to others, uh -huh. he's hitting some ball, he hit the ball very hard. He hit the ball? Yeah. Okay, so we say he, can we say he hit? Yeah, you know the cricket player, you know? He's, the hit is very hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, fine. We will say he hit, since you said he hit the ball. Okay? Hmm. They, they hit. Da? Hmm. They hit. They hit. They hit. Yes. Yes, please, from the back. Yes, yes, yes. A group hit. A group hit. Oh, what the last day hit? I will no. uh, she will hit him. She will hit him. She will hit him, huh? <laughs> she will hit. Okay. Now. Now. Very good. Okay. One who hits a lot, yes? No, no. Yes, please. Any meaning you wish to express from hitting, the last one. Any meaning. Uh, any meaning from hitting that you want to make up in Arabic? Maybe he will hit. Maybe he will hit? No, that is. That is using other words with it. Hmm. He can hit. He can hit? He hit a lot. They got hit. 
hits repeat, uh, repeatedly, like continuously. So it's like difference between like a lot and something that's always over and over and over again at the same meaning. So it's a lot. So you mentioned two things. You mentioned like it's a lot and hit. I don't know. Do you understand it? Okay. Like continuous hitting, like from the stop. Okay. Try another one. They both female. I want to use the easy ones, huh? They both female. female. Huh? They both female. Both of the females hit. Both. Females hit. Yes, I want to He hit himself? He hit himself? <laughs> well, that's still going to hit. Oh, no. Yes. No. We. We. Okay. We. We hit. Yes. He is hitting. He is hitting? He is hitting? He is hitting. He is hitting. Okay. He is hitting. Yes. Yes, please. This is an interactive class. This is the only way you're going to learn. Huh? Yes. Uh, new. Someone, someone who hasn't answered before. Huh? Yes. Give me up. Any meaning you wish to express? You. You. Me? Yes. Yeah. Anything. Could be anything. He was hit. He was hit. Very well. Very good. He was hit. Beautiful. Huh? Is that your brother? The other brother. Yep. Huh? He will hit. Huh? He will hit. He will hit. Okay. He will hit. Very good. That's another shot. Now, watch this. <laughs> now, you are going to notice one thing. And it's a very important thing. That I am going to use those three letters in all of those meanings, believe it or not, all of those meanings, I'm going to use the same letters. But every different meaning will get a different form of those letters. Use the same letters, but it's going to be what? A different form. That means I'm going to change how it looks somehow. Each form is going to have a different appearance than the other form. Uh, I'm just going to mention the dual form. Two people. Oh, yeah, we have it here. Both. Oh, yeah, the idea is just to show. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, Amazing, isn't it? It's not, it's not going to stop here. But now, what have we done? 
we moved the same letters of the source word elsewhere and what I mean by elsewhere is for a certain meaning different types of different meanings that you wish to express you are going to turn from the same or using the same letters in Arabic and each meaning that you want to express has a principle that means we have a principle to teach you to allow you to produce those the, you, those forms by yourself by yourself now what is this called the sign do do all of you know those signs who doesn't know those signs who's completely new and does not know the fatha the zabar and the page and the what you call it zir uh, everyone knows it everyone okay good now what's this then but correct what's this sukun sukun means no haraka no fatha no kasar no bam that's what it means basically okay what about this bam this is two two bams okay now now what I'm going to do in each form I'm going to change it's going to look different than this form. Then this appears is going to look different. Okay? So, let's start for example with this or this. So far, is it the same? So far, is it the same? Yeah. It's the same so far, right? What about now? Huh? Why? Uh huh? Instead of a instead of a sukun on the ra, what did the ra take here? Huh? Fatha, right? Okay. Then here, what does the bat have? Huh? You can say it in Urdu if you want, if you if you wish. If you're comfortable with that, say it in Urdu first, and then we'll convert you, Shah. Okay. Now, the same letters letters are used, but what happened? We changed. The halakat, and we changed the general way the word looks. Now, what does this read? Darabha. Darabha means I. Means he is. So, what have we done? We have turned the root word into a different. <coughs> Form to express a different meaning. How is it different? Because dog means hitting. But I want to produce a different meaning or to express a different meaning, which is me doing that act in the past tense. So I changed the form of the word to express that particular meaning. Understood? Let's take another example. One of you said, one who hits a lot. Okay? Or let's start with, with the simplest. Let's say for example, he was hit. Is he got hit? Okay. Now this time, instead of the fatha on the dot, I'm going to place a dhamma. And for the ra, I'm going to give a kasra. And for the ba, I'm going to give fatha. 
What does this read? Huh? Buri ba. Buri ba. Buri ba means he was it. What did I do? I turned the word into a different form. Can I say he was hit by saying Baraba? No. Can I say he hit by saying Duriba? No. Each form has its own meaning. Understood? Okay. Now, both females hit. What does this look like? Which one? He hits. But it's not, it does not end there. I'm going to add a ta and I'm going to get a fit hat with an elif. What does this read now? Barabata. So see, the changing in the form could be by adding a letter or it could be by changing the harakat. Okay? But it's never deducting a letter. Those letters will always be there because those letters are what we call and describe as original letters. The original letters never fall they always remain. Only those letters that are extra which fall. Like the ta. Do you see the ta here? So the ta sometimes falls from some forms. Do you see the edif here? Or here? No. This indicates that the ta is an extra letter, not an original one. So what's the difference between the original letters and the extra letters? See, the original letters are the letters which stay in all forms, no matter what form it is. Okay? And the extra letters are those letters which are found in some and not found in others. Clear? Okay. Then we want to say, let's, let's do it in order. He will hit. Now I'm going to add a scene and a ya and give the ba the sukun this time. And the ra a kasra and the ba a Can you read this? Sa, ya, ri, bu. Sa ri means he is going to hit. He will hit. How many letters have I added? Two. two. Here? Two. two. Here? No. Nothing. Okay? He is hitting. What does that mean? Yeah? The? He is hitting. So you know from Yadribu that when we add a scene, the scene implies what? Which meaning? Will. Okay? There we go. We hit. What does that mean? Darab? Na. Darab? Na. That means we hit. One who hits a lot. What does that mean? Darab? Darab? Bun. This sign here that looks like a little W, this means that they are two identical letters. 
The first one is silent and the second one has a halakha. It was merged in writing into one and given this sign to express that. Voila, clear? Please pay attention. This little W here, what does it express? It expresses that there were two identical letters in a row. The first one is silent, the second one has a halakha. It was merged into one because it's almost merged in what? In pronunciation. La, 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 la. So it was given a little W to express that or to indicate that. And this one, this, whatever comes here on the second identical letter is placed over the W. <coughs> over the little W. Clear? Wadek? Mafum? Like. Then she will hit. She will hit. Here we said Sayyadribu. Here we're going to say Satabribu. Wow. Instead of Sayyadribu, Sata, Ta. Only one letter changed the whole meaning. And sometimes only one haraka changes the whole meaning. See? So if one haraka, one single haraka, could change the whole meaning, how would you understand the Quran if you don't know Arabic? If only one haraka changes the whole meaning. Okay? They hit. This time I'm going to add a wow. What does this read? Barabu. That elephant at the end is not pronounced. Barabu. 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 Barabu means what? They hit. Is it different? Is it different than the rest, rest of the forms? Yes. See? Different forms for different meanings. She got hit, hit. Here I said when he got hit, I said Buriba. Here I'm going to say Buribat. So the ta here will indicate the femininity. Now, see, everything that I do here is going to be the same with every meaning I choose. Whether it be hitting, drinking, eating, walking, it's going to be the same way. Same way. So, akala sayaku. There's only going to be a difference where here, in this, in this middle letter. Sayaku, sayashabaku, sayakabu. Sayaktulu, Sayakfu. It's going to be the same. Same way. To express the same meaning is going to be the same form or the same idea of the form. Okay? Then we have the one being hit. Okay? Here we add a meme this time. And then after the middle letter, we add a wa. And we give the following. What does this read? Mel, mel, magru. And again, if I want to express anything that received an act, it's going to be the same way. Magru, makul, mashru. No, this is, you cannot apply this on this because mafrul only comes from an act which has a receiver, a transitive act. And walking is not a transitive act. So makul, mashrul, maktub, makhluq. Wadeh? Don't you say mashkul? Ma'lum? Mathum, it's all the same thing. That's where, where it comes from. Okay, Mathum is the thing that is known. Mathum, the thing that is understood. 
the thing that received understanding. Wadeh, makul, the thing that is eaten. Mashrub, the, the drink itself that is wadeh. See, it's going to be the same way. So you're going to have the principle. You're going to be given a principle. So whatever you want to express that, add a meaning with the wadeh. For example, okay. Then the one hitting ba erib ba. This is the one hitting, and the one being described with such an act. Then I get. Now, now and only now will you understand the definition that you have written. Changing or turning, hmm, turning the root word. There's always a root word that you start from. It's going to be your starting point to produce and build different forms. Changing the root huh, word into different are they um, are they similar identical no they're different why should I change the root word into different forms what is the reason what is the purpose to express different meanings and those meanings aren't expressed except through their particular own forms each meaning has its own form. It has its own form. You cannot say we hit saying yadrim. You cannot express he is hitting saying baratna. You cannot express duribat meaning he was hit and vice versa. So is that what's called nadribu? Nadribu, yes. Nadribu, we are hitting. Oh, so it's an action. Yes, it's an action. It's a verb action. Yeah. Any questions so far? Hmm. Yes. Yes. Here, here uh, music is the number for I, U, E, C, E, type person. Yes. But if object comes, like one vehicle hit the person, so here we use the vehicle, say here a dollar like this? No, here we're going to use another word. Because when you said he hit a person, that person will have a word which expresses it. So you say Barabtu Khalidan, Barabtu Amran, Barabtu Al Aduwa, etc. Barabtu Sayyidah, maybe, yes. Barabtu Hadi. Barabtu Hadi? No. Meskin. Lis Sayyidah. That's why the brother was saying, was saying she hits. Lis Sayyidah, Sheikh. But today, nowadays, maybe it's she hits. <laughs> She's doing the hitting now. Darabtuha now. He says maybe it's a sayyara. Darabtuha now. A sayyara because the sayyara is feminine. So you say Darabtuha now. Sorry, then I misunderstood it. My apologies. Now. I'm Madrub, yes. You pronounce Madrub, but it's the original Madrub. Yes, why? He said, the, 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 the brother said, you said madrub, although what is written is madrub. Bon. Why? Because they have a principle. It says whenever you end with a word, silence its end. If you are speaking and you're going on, don't silence. But if you stop, silence. This is a principle. Okay? So, for example, when you say Alhamdulillahi, could you can finish the verse? Alhamdulillahi. Alameen. What have you done? You silence the end. Although Al Alameen is Al Alameen. But if you continue reading, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Rahman Rahim, etc. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Rahim. You silence. But if you continue, Ah. Ar Rahim, me. Quran teachers, they always, or some of them, always let the student continue the verses. Why? So you can teach them the harakah of the last. Because usually when you end with the verse, you don't 
and speak out the haraka. Well, then, no. Uh, you are changing some haraka or adding some. Uh, yeah, that yes. You are changing the meanings. So you know that's why you are doing. But is that any structure? How? Are yes, you? that's what we'll teach you here. Exactly. <laughs> this structure, this is what you're going to learn in this science. I'm going to give you the structure of how to build those forms, the principles, the ways. By the end of this course, inshallah, depending on you, because 70% of the work is on the student, alhamdulillah, you, when you have those principles, you'll be able to form, to build all those different forms by the principles which you are going to obtain. Inshallah. Now. I want to say another book. Uh, I want to say another book. I want to say another book that that we give. So let's say if I want to stop, I can say another book. Another book. No problem. Right? I don't have to stress on the. No. As long as this is this is a general principle. When you end with a word, you silence it. There are certain exceptions, like when you end with a tap, you turn it into a hat. When you end with a tamid with a fatha, you you turn it you you just turn it to an elif. They are different, you know. There are exceptions, but the general principle, the main principle, is the Arabs don't end with a haraka. Neither do they start with a sukun. The Arabs don't end with a haraka. Neither do they start with a sukun. The starting with the, with the sukun is where? Yeah. Which language? Other languages. Okay? Like still. Still. That's starting with the sukun. But in Arabic, this is considered to be heavy speech. Starting with the sukun is difficult in Arabic. In the Arabic tongue. So that's why we never start with what? With the sukun. We always start with what? With the haraka. See? All of those words, you will not find a word starting with a sukun. It's always a haraka in the beginning. But if you end with a word, you silence its end. That silencing of the end is only temporary. Temporary. Yani, since you ended. But if you're speaking, if you're continuing speaking, that goes back to how it was, how it, how it was written originally. Clear? Well, yeah. Okay. This, you don't have to write all this, you don't have to memorize all this. This is just giving you an idea of what you're going to learn. Now, back in your mind, it's very clear what you're going to be able to do. Because I gave you the definition and explained it to you. Wabah. Wabah means, is it clear? That's what Wabah means. Wadihna? Wadih. Huh? Wadihna? No, no, Wadihna, no. It doesn't work then. <laughs> okay? So, is it everyone now knows the idea of Saf? What you're going to learn? And why you're learning this? Okay, they say before we end, there's only two minutes left, or one minute. The benefit of this science is what? All Arabic sciences are salt most importantly to do what? to understand the Quran and the Sunnah if you are here to just learn how to speak I don't mind but I wish that you change this intention of yours to something else which is more honorable and beneficial for you because if you learn just to speak, then this, is, this becomes something which is only permissible. That means no reward is involved in it. 
But if you learn this to understand the Quran and the Sunnah, then you get rewarded. Because you wanted through it to reach to what? To an act of worship. And if so, you will turn this into an act of worship according to your intention. So they say there are two benefits. The first benefit is understanding the Quran and the Sunnah correctly. Correctly. So you will know that whoever does not have the nice language will end up misunderstanding and misinterpreting the Quran and the Sunnah whether he likes it or not. Unless he depends fully on what he takes from the scholar, that's something else. But as long as a person does not have Arabic, he cannot understand the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzallahu Qur'anan arabiyyan la'allakum ta'iloon. Verily, we have sent it down an Arabic Qur'an that you may understand. Clear. The verse is clear. It does not need any other interpretation. The second benefit that you get is speaking the words, the Arabic words, in a correct manner. That should be your secondary thing. But your main intention, if your intention was something else, I advise you that this is the best intention for you to learn the Quran and the Sunnah because it is a unanimous agreement by our scholars that whoever does not have the language cannot utter one word about this religion. One single word as Ibn Hazm says. One word, unanimous agreement. Yeah, you know what it means, unanimous agreement? That means nobody different. There's no dispute in this. And this corrects what people say today. Some people, and I say people, I don't see people of knowledge, because they're not people of knowledge. They say, you don't need Arabic to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. Why did such a a statement arise. It is because people who aren't knowledgeable start speaking in much, speaking in religion. Everyone wants to have his say, to have his opinion. Especially if the person did not have the language, he would wish that it was that way. That it was that way so it could be easy for him to say whatever he wants to say. So no, it's a unanimous agreement. That means there's no difference. And if, you, if I wish I could do two classes, just translating, translating for you the statements of the scholars in that. I could do two classes. That's how much statements they have regarding this issue. They made it a condition to the scholar to learn Arabic, a condition. You will never be a scholar until you learn Arabic. Never. You will not have the ability and the tools to understand the Quran and the Sunnah and to derive the rulings from them to say, Hada halal wa hada haram. You can never do that without Arabic. Never ever. It, it's easy for us to go back to the book of Tafsir. We have, MashaAllah, all the meanings are written here, ready. But you know how long it takes the scholars to reach to those meanings? Yani, if it's not long, but what's the, the, the process? It's a long process. You have to analyze the verse grammatically and morphologically. And you have to consider other ahadith verses that might specify this verse or might clarify this verse. It's a long process. It's not easy. The scholars went through much to study the principles and the foundations of the tools necessary to be gained to present to us the summation of the meanings of the Quran. And I could bring many examples just from this English interpretation. Examples on that from an English interpretation. I could show you. English interpretations where they have translated or uh, interpreted a verse not how it, how it seems 
because of an Arabic principle, for example. Okay? No. Right. Any questions? Any further questions? No. Does master have a technical meaning? Yes, the verbal noun. Yes. That's the technical meaning of and master is the name. If you want to write the meaning to it technically, an easy one for you, the name you give an act one does. The name you give an act one does. Or the name you give the act itself, regardless the time frame. Throw the book at the 
nearest table, on the nearest table, as you see, and don't study at all, or don't revise, it's going to be difficult. But I'm going to give you an easy way that needs, doesn't need too much, too much of an effort. Now, this is a, 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 a advised and, and a tried way, of, uh, even advised by our scholars. If you want to yeah, do the least into revising the, the, what you have learned, when you go home, just read, only read, what you have written or what you have learned, just read it three times. They say five times, and then the second day four, four times, and then the following day three times, and the same lesson, and then two, and then one. But we're going to say, start with three, then two, and then one. You get my point? So you go today, let's say, I learned something today. So I go today and I read it. I just read it. Three times. Once, twice, three times. Then I close the book. The following day, I read the same lesson which I took before yesterday. And I read it twice this time. The third day, I read it once. By this way, inshallah, you will not forget anything. Inshallah. Okay? Try to have a study partner. Because I'm speaking about myself as well. If we were left alone, we would never do anything. Unless if there's someone in the back pushing us. Okay? So have someone with you to say to you, Brother, where have you been today? I was waiting for you. Okay? Have someone with you to study. And the best study partner, if you have one, is your wife. Study with her, okay? You might to get to throw some words around the house and the kids pick it up. Wonderful. Well then? Okay? Uh, try to not occupy yourself with things that are less important. Worry about what you, what, what you are given on the board. Don't ask for more details, just as long as you're not given them. Why? Because this will deviate you away from what you're supposed to focus on in the beginning. Trust me, the more you go deep inside, every question will be answered. So don't ask for details that you're not in need of, or that you could be not in need of now. All the details will come in due time. And this, I say in every, every science. Because the teacher, when he teaches you, if he teaches you the right way, he will start with the, yeah, the most important things in that particular science. Okay? That's why our scholars, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala, you see them, they have big books, and then they abbreviate those books and then they even abbreviated more. Why? Because they are helping the beginner. They want him to start off huh, easily. If, if you see there today, especially in our days, if we see a book of three volumes, I'm never going to read this. Correct? But if it's, if it's a small book, I'll say, oh my, look at this book, mashallah. And the title is all dashing. And this is a problem with today, the titles. People being attracted to titles and not knowing the author. Even if he was a chemist and speaking in religion, they would take it. Just as long as the title is dashing, mashallah. But anyways, that uh, if it's a small book, it's easy, right? So this is why, see? Small books, look how small they are, mashallah. Okay? Small books, but they contain big knowledge because those are the mother principles in this particular science. So you start off with this, know the main principles. Then, when you you when you finish learning the main principles, you have formed what a foundation for the house you're going to build, the house of knowledge, be it in that you're going to build. When you finish the foundation, this is how it works. This is how people do it. They start with the foundation first, and then they start building. But people today, they want to jump to building 
before even forming the foundation. That's why the house will fall in due time. Okay? So don't worry about collecting different bits of information because that's just like the person carrying a bag of eggs and running with it. You're running and you're fetching every book you could get your hands on and you're reading everything and you just want to know, you want to be a scholar now, now, today before tomorrow. It doesn't happen that way. It needs much time. And you need to start step by step and inshallah. If you start step by step, you learn. That's why one of the scholars said, in old ancient times, he said, And whoever took this knowledge at once, it will leave him at once. Yes, there are some people who would love to be scholars, who would love to have a lot of knowledge to teach it to others, who have sincerity and zeal and a good intention. But the good intention does not rectify the bad action. You want to? Okay, but you have to do it the same way. You have to walk their walk and you will reach how they have reached. But if you are not even following their advice and the way they have sought, you will not reach like they have reached. Common sense. It is common sense. Wadah barakallahu fikum. Knowledge needs time. Needs time. Just like anything else. Any, I'm sure most of you here have studied and they have their certificates. Did you study in one month and you got that certificate? No. These are in worldly. Sciences, what about the Islamic ones? Let's jump to the second topic, inshallah. Second topic is fiqh. Now, we need to know what fiqh means. We're always going to start with the definition. And trust me, there are two things. If you master, everything is going to become easy in that particular science that you're learning. The first thing is what? The first thing is the definitions and the second thing are the principles. Focus on those two, everything will be easy. Trust me. Trust me. There's two things. Definitions. Whenever you get a definition, write it down. Don't let it go. And a principle, write it down, don't let it go. Okay? So, the word Al-Fiqh. Al-Fiqh. Al-Fiqh, it means understanding. Understanding. You don't understand the much of what you say. So that they understand what I say. Whoever Allah wanted good for you, they can understand this religion. So I think is understanding. Understanding what? Linguistically. Linguistically, any understanding. General. Why? I told you this is the quality of the what? Of the linguistic meaning, it is general, it's not specified. It's unspecified. Well then. Now, in Sharia and in religion, the general religious meaning to fiqh is understanding the rulings of Allah. Understanding the rulings of Allah. Shari? Shari? Yeah, Shari. We call it Shari, yes. This is the first technical meaning you can say. The first technical meaning which is the religious religious meaning. Then we have the scientific. 
if you may, scientific. Scientific meaning to the word fiqh. Scientific we mean religious. Who means it? Allah and who? Or his? Huh? Messenger. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a word, an Arabic word, for a specific meaning. Sometimes the Prophet uses an Arabic word for a specific meaning. Okay? Like al -ghiba. al -ghiba, the Prophet وسلم, gave us the meaning. Dhikruka akhaka bima yakar. Speaking about your brother with that which he hates to be spoken. Father, Nusuk. Allah said the word Nusuk. Nusuk, what is it that Nusuk mean? Sacrifice. But Nusuk in Arabic does not mean just sacrifice. It means what? It means worship. Worshipping. Any worshipping is called Nusuk. Watanasuk. That's why the companion came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Araita ma kunna natanasafu bihi. Do you see that? which we used to do as acts of worship before Islam. What about those good deeds that we used to do before Islam, etc. So he used the word natanasak, which means we worship. But Allah, when He used nusuk, He meant a certain and a specific type of worship, which is sacrifice. So if you don't know those, those terms, how will you know? How would you understand the Quran? Well, then, so this is the religious meaning. The religious meaning is one type of the technical meanings that are used. The scientific meaning we mean uh, uh, originated by a group of huh, scholars. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is yes, yeah. This yes, istilah yes, istilah. Istilah. Yes, we said yesterday it was istilah, but technical meaning you say istilah hey, istilah hey, istilah hey. Okay. Istilah hey means referred to istilah, referred to the technical usage. E, E at the end, this is used for reference. <clears throat> Hindi, Amriki, Sarfi, Nahwi, and so on. Okay? A group of scholars, a group of scholars said to themselves, we want to speak and study and analyze the rulings concerning the practices of the same adult. Those scholars, group of scholars, are called al-fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh, the jurists, if you may. Okay? They said, we want, yes, we want to speak about the rulings of Allah, but we want to speak about certain rulings, not all the rulings. Not the rulings of belief. The rulings of practices. Prayer, salt, bahara, hajj, nikah, mu'amalat, etc. We want to speak about those rulings. Not all rulings, just those rulings. We're going to use the same word which is, but we 
will specify that further. When we use the word fiqh, it's going to be a bit different than the fiqh, the general meaning of the fiqh in religion. Okay? That's how they did it. The scholars, they only used the Arabic words. So they took a word from the dictionary, it had a general meaning. What did they do? So what's the meaning of the word al-fiqh in scientifically understanding? The rulings of the Understanding the religious, pardon me, religious rulings of. Practices of the same adult. The same adult. Same who is not the same. Adult to be purity. Okay. Say. 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 The opposite of insane. Okay, so can you tell me what's the difference between the scientific meaning and the religious one? Scientific specifies the religious one. Yes, it's more specific. Yes. It's more specific than how? The same thing, specifying is for saying the laws. No, before that. Specifying which? Uh, specifying that's the good of what rulings are all Ah, what rulings. Very good. Because here it generalizes all the rulings of Allah. But here? The rulings of what? Practices, not beliefs. Not beliefs. Outer practices, not inner. Well then, practices, not beliefs. Well then, clear. Now, every act you do, every act. You do has a ruling in Islam. Every act you do, whether with your eyes, whether intentional, not intentional, whether it's done from, hmm, from a woman or a man, every act has a certain ruling in this complete Sharia, Alhamdulillah. Knowing the rulings of those acts are learned where? Where? Infant. Understand? Every act you do, huh? the act you're doing, the act you're doing, placing your hand on your chin, the act you're doing, every act has its ruling in Islam. This act that I'm doing, it has a ruling in Islam. So, understanding those rulings and how those rulings were given to those acts based upon what? And how do we understand the evidence which, uh, uh, upon which those rulings are based? 
This is what we learn in where? In? In fiqh. What? That's, that's about it. That's what we learn in fiqh. Now, in order for us to understand, we have to know what are the religious rulings. So we have to know that the rulings are five. Father is 
what? The majority of scholars accept the Hanafis. Yes. Wajib, Farq, the same. What is Farq is Wajib and it is Wajib is Farq. No. Mm -hmm. Halal is used in opposition of haram. That which is not which is not haram is halal in general. Okay? That is a religious meaning. But this is a scientific meaning. Halal is used to express what is generally in the opposition of haram even if it's obligatory or preferred. Understand? Halal means you can do it. It might be obligatory to do it, it might be preferred to do it, but halal is used as a general term as in what is opposition, in opposition of something you cannot do. Sunnah is another name for mustahab. Sunnah is another name for what? Mustahab. That means how many meanings do we have to the word sunnah now? Three. Three. The, the, the linguistic meaning is what? The way. The religious meaning? The technical meaning? The preferred act. See how many meanings to we have to the word the sunnah? And because people confuse those meanings together or think that a word has only one meaning, and funny, they think that the technical meaning is only meant from the word. Huh? That's why the confusion happens. And people will consider to, to that to be, that, that is wajib to be preferred, or that which is preferred to be wajib. People might confuse the two. Okay? What is the ruling of reading another surah after Al-Fatiha? There we go. There we go. See? Wajib. It's not wajib. See? This, how did it happen from people not making a difference between the terms, the meaning of the terms? So people, this is why people believe things that are only must have to be fault. And things that are proud to be must have because they do not make a clear distinction between those meanings and those terms. What then? Clear? This is written inshallah. All right. Let's elaborate, inshallah, on those thoughts. Wajib. No, my dear brother, may Allah bless you. And shower with you with his mercy. That, and sister, that both, and the rulings all, they go back to something which is commanded and something which is huh, for beginning. Now I'm giving you the same rulings but in another classification, another way. Classified differently. In the middle is something which does not involve a command or a forbidding. Now the things which are commanded are of two types and the things which are forbidden are of two types. Did you know 
that the mustahab is commanded? And did you know that the dislike is forbidden? What do I mean? Uh, who knows what I mean? Did you know that the mustahab is commanded? And the dislike is forbidden? Where did we know that this thing is mustahab? See, there are commands and forbiddings. They all got, the ruling go back to this. So, for example, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Awtiru ya ahl al-Qur'an fa inna allaha wikru yuhibbu Awtiru What does the awtiru mean? Pray with him. Pray with him. Pray. What is that called? A command. Although praying with her is it wajib or mustahab? It's mustahab. Okay. So where did the mustahab come from? It is a command. Which was released, but not in an obliging manner. Okay, let's start, inshallah, step by step. The command. The command comes out in two ways. It is either commanded in an obliging manner, and you have to do it, you don't have a choice. Okay? But sometimes we have other proof proving that that command was not meant in an obliging manner, but just a guidance to what is best. I'll give you an example. Okay. Now the Prophet sallallahu said, "What awtiru?" That means pray with it. Okay? But in another hadith, we find that the Prophet وسلم, was approached by an Arab, a man, and said, Tell me what Allah has prescribed upon me of prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ said five prayers in the day and night. How many? Five. So if we go back to that command, Awtiru, we understand that that command, was it meant in an obliging manner? Awtiru, pray with them. Was it meant that it is something that you have to do? Or it's optional? Huh? What do you think? Why? How did we know? From that other hadith. That gave us proof that that command was not meant in an obliging manner. But that command was a preference. A recommendation. Okay? So when to know if something, if a certain command is in a obliging manner or not? We say the general principle to that is that when there is a command, by default it is not optional. You have to do it. This is a principle which says the command implies what? Huh? Obligation. Obligation. The command implies 
is by default. Why? Because by default, the command you receive from someone who is superior to you is not supposed to be optional. Well then, that means if your father tells you, do this, can you say, I'll think about it? Huh? <laughs> can you say? No, see? And the proof is, the boy said no. <laughs> okay? You can't say, well, well I'll, think about, I'll go and think about it. No, you can't. Because he who is superior to you, he gives you a command. By default, it is, huh? It's a must to follow. Okay? Now that is, if it was your father, if it was someone superior, if it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if it was Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and he said, do this, will you say, I'll think about it? No. By default, what is understood from every command, that it implies what? When does it not imply obligation? Of course, the proof to this, that every command implies obligation, is the saying of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ This is Surah Al-Nur, which is Surah number 24. Verse number 63. Let those who oppose the Messenger's commandment beware lest some fitna should befall them or a painful torment be inflicted on them. Let those who oppose the Messenger's what? Commandment. Beware lest a trial should befall them or a painful torment should be inflicted on them. Painful torment. Are you going to be punished for something which is optional? Or something which is obligatory? So this verse proves that whenever there is a command, if you do not do it, there is what? Punishment. Punishment, which means that every command implies obligation. Unless proven otherwise. Unless we have another proof that says otherwise. Understand? So here, if we apply this principle on the saying of the Prophet wasallam, pray with him. Now, if you did not have any other proof and you heard the Prophet wasallam saying, pray with him, what would you say? Samirna wa apa'na. Are you saying that? No. Samirna wa apa'na. Okay? But if you have another proof, if you heard the Prophet wasallam again saying that the prayers which are obligatory upon you, which don't in, you know, concern a reason, are five prayers of the day and night. What would you understand from the saying of the Prophet wasallam at first? Pray with the recommendation. It's a recommendation. Based upon what? Based upon your preferences? Your desire, your mere opinion, your rationale? No. Based upon what? Proof. Evidence. Proof. That's how the scholars do it. That is how the scholars do it. See, the scholars, they have <coughs> a text, right? Releasing a command, correct? Pray with her. Uh, the scholars see, pray with her. They apply this principle. They say, an amr, the command, implies obligation. So if the Prophet said, pray with her, that means we have to do it. That means this is what, let's say, in the beginning. Then the scholars came across another hadith. They said, this hadith proves that the prayers, the unspecified prayers, which are obligatory, are five prayers only in the day and night according to that hadith. So this indicates that the command here to pray with him is not an obliging manner, but only a recommendation. So they say, ah, so with is recommended. 
So where did their recommendation come from? Understand? The recommendation came from a command that was taken down a level because of another proof. Otherwise the command stayed in that level. Stays at the level of what obligation? If there's another proof, it takes it down a level to being only huh, recommended. Not permissible. Recommended. Recommended is different than permissible. Permissible that means there's no reward to it. Unless it leads to something else. But recommended means there's a reward. Understand? Is this clear? Okay. So you see how the scholars do it? The scholars do it with what? With evidence. They do it with evidence. But today how do people do it? Especially on the media. You get every type of huh? different types of people speaking about religion. What do you hear? Hmm? Even if you didn't have, have Arabic, in my opinion, I think, I would presume, I would expect that this would be recommended and not obligatory. This is classified by our scholars by their unanimous agreement as a sinfulness to speak in matters of religion without having the proper tools. To say, I think, I presume, I see that this is stronger. You say, you do not see already. You don't have the, the tools to see. Just like the one who has a weak sight cannot see without his glasses. You don't have the tools. How can you say, I see, and you don't see? So see, the scholars, how they do it, they do it according to a proof. Not just a mere preference, personal preference, or uh, according uh, or, 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 or emotionally, no. Rational. This proof, that proof, put it together, this command does not imply obligation. Are they? See, if you learn those principles, everything will fall in place. And you will understand how the scholars reach to the evidence and why they have disputed, etc. And you will also discover the matters that are disputed today. And in reality, it's not a matter of dispute. But it is just because some people who have no knowledge claim that it is a dispute, and it's not a dispute. It's just because they misunderstood. Clear? That's why you have people today saying music is permissible. You have people today saying that uh, the woman covering is permissible. Permissible. None of the scholars said that. That it is permissible. Because if you say permissible, you are implying that there's no command regarding that ruling, that act. And it's not just permissible. It goes back to one of two rulings. Commanded or, per or preferred. And if it's preferred, that means there's reward in doing it. See? So understanding those principles will allow you to put everything in its place. Okay. So some issue might seem there's oh it's too big and there's a lot of dispute. But with those principles, you say, oh no, no, they just disputed at this point. But the rest they have agreed upon. What about the Maybe five minutes or six minutes for questions. So we'll continue this, inshallah, next Saturday, if Allah keeps us alive. Now,
Fredrickson that yes. we categorize the last one as you know the, the, the one like that like is Yes, yes, I understand. The brother is asking that yesterday we said that the meaning, that the scientific meaning of the word sunnah is that act which is preferred, and then we mentioned. Uh, for example, one of the uh, descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to have his hair up until here, his ears. Okay? So we say that is exactly what we consider a sunnah. If it's a sunnah, we say that sunnah means what? Means it is preferred. We say there's a difference between the technical meaning of a sunnah to the people of Hadith and to the meaning of a Sunnah to the people of Fiqh and the meaning to a Sunnah to the people of Usul. Usul means the foundations of Fiqh. Those principles that we have given you now, those principles belong to a science which is called Usul al Fiqh. Now, Usul al Fiqh means the foundations or the, the, the fundamental principles of jurisprudence which you are learning. You are learning jurisprudence now. There's another science which jurisprudence is based on. And this science is basically the tools that the scholar should have to derive the rulings. That science is called Usul al-Fiqh. Okay? Now Usul al-Fiqh, they say the Sunnah is what? They say the Sunnah is every act where we could take from it an Islamic ruling, a religious ruling. Well, then, so this would exclude what the Prophet وسلم, his length of hair. Okay? Because that, can we take from it a religious ruling for people to follow? No. I hope this answers your question. So there are different technical terms to Sunnah according to the different sciences. In Aqeedah, in Creed, for example, the word Sunnah is used. Do you think that in beliefs we're going to use the word Sunnah to mean preferred? No. But what does Sunnah mean by the by the scholars of, of, of Aqeedah, the scholars of Creed? It means what opposes what opposes the innovation. That means that there are sects that have originated in Islam. Many sects that have originated. And they came up with things, and those things became uh, yeah, the, uh, like, a, like, a, like a famous description of those sects. Okay? Like a common thing about them. So the common thing about the Khawarij, for example, the Khawarij, I says, are, are what? The main blood of Muslim. Uh, they say, for example, that the major sins cause you to disbelieve, for example. So the scholar tells you, the scholar in Creed, he tells you, a sunnah is that the major sin does not make you a disbeliever. So a sunnah here was mentioned in opposition to, the, to a deviation that a certain sect is known by. See? Now the sunnah here has another scientific and technical term different than, than what? Than the meaning of the, the same word in another science, which is the science here. So the sunnah in the in theology or in, in creed, what does it mean? It means the way of the people of truth. The way of Ahlu Sunnah. That's why they called Ahlu Sunnah. As Ibn Abbas said in interpreting the verse Ibn Abbas. Who is Ibn Abbas? Who is Ibn Abbas? 
one of the great, one of the biggest scholars of who? The companions of who? Of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said regarding the verse, يَوْمَ تَبْيَضُّ وُجُوهُ وَتَسْوَدُّ وُجُوهُ He says, well, on the day where some faces will become white, and some faces will become black, he said what? He says, the, the faces of Ahlu Sunnah, that's him saying, not me, the faces of Ahlu Sunnah will, be, will become white. So he called them what? Ahlu Sunnah, that means the right way, the people of the right way. The people of the Sunnah of the Prophet the way of the Prophet So the right way regarding the major sins is that they don't cause you to disbelieve as many people believe. Because that is a belief of a deviated sect which is called a For example, okay, well then. Another famous deviation that many sects have is that they speak ill about the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu So we say as Sunnah if we're talking Cree, we say as Sunnah al Imsat wa Amma Shajara Bayna Sahab wa Thana wa Alihi wa Adamu al Ta'ni fihi wa Ta'abu. What does that mean? That means the Sunnah is to refrain and abstain from speaking in anything related to the differences that happen between the companions. We only hold for them what the complete praise and we don't dare speak ill about any of them. This is the way of Ahlu Sunnah. This is the Sunnah. Means this is the guided way, the, 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 the guide, the right way. The right way is to not speak bad about any companion of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu To speak only good about them, no matter, no matter what they did. Well, this is a sunnah in opposition to a deviance that many sects are upon. You see the word a sunnah? So a sunnah in usul means a way from which you can take a religious ruling. Now, the hair, did they take it from it a religious ruling? No. They said this is only a ada, a habit that the Prophet وسلم, used to have. So that means no one can come and say, I, it is preferred to grow hair to the ears because the Prophet وسلم, did it. We say, the Prophet ﷺ did it not as something preferred. So if you do it as something preferred, you are opposing the Prophet ﷺ, not following him. Even, even if you're following him outwardly. But in the reality of the matter, you're not following him. Why? Because he did it how... No, no, he did it. The Prophet ﷺ, he did it out of what? A habit. And you're doing it out of what? A worship. You're taking it as a ritual, and he did not. Well then, so if we are doing it as a book, out of book, is it everyone? Even if you're doing it out of hope, because if you're doing it out of hope, that means you are expecting from Allah a reward out of this hope. You are seeing it as something which is pleasing to Allah, and that means you're finding it mustahab, etc. Now. The lahya is by the anonymous agreement of the scholars, wajib. But they have differed, as we said before, between uh, to, uh, in the matter of the extent that the lahya is grown, grown, and that will come, inshallah, later. Now, any other question? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Can you just repeat the um, name of the Prophet? Um, the act which is preferred. By the Fuqaha, the act which is preferred. Even though a lot of them don't use that term, by the way. They use mustahab. Only a minority use it. Now, 
but you said you said something about um, deriving a religious group. Ah, as usul, as meaning of sunnah to and usuliyin. Nah, nah. So finally, we can say all mustahabs are sunnah. Yes. Yes. In which way? In which meaning? In the technical. Yes. Which technical mood? Uh, to the jurists. Yes, they are people. To the jurists. Okay. Yes. And Sunnah may be obligatory. Yes. That means, uh, wajib, yes, if it's used with which meaning? To something to people. Huh? Yes, Sunnah in the general. In the general meaning, very good. The way of the Prophet, the general way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or the usuli meaning. Now, maybe wajib, maybe mustahab, maybe mubah, maybe haram also. No, it is either yes, the sunnah in the general way. Yani, no, the general way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whatever he said, did, affirmed, or attributed. The attributes. Yeah, which I mean, like the uh, yes, this permissible. yes. If you go here, just just because it's permissible. And uh, I mean, uh, sunnah uh, sun of Rasulullah uh, taking more than four wives. It's haram for us. Yes, because there's proof that that was speci uh, specifically and is something that only the Prophet was, was, was permissible only to the Prophet yeah. So even it is a Sunnah of Rasulullah in the general meaning? The general yes, but this is exclusive. Yes, it's Haram for us. Leaving a Haram thing, is it considered as an act of worship? Leaving Haram in a row? Of course. Because this is following the command of Allah. Allah told you to leave the haram and to leave the makroor, but optionally. So if you leave the haram or the makroor, this is considered to be an act of worship. Now, Allah was no. Actually, they say that the halal things are clear and the haram things are also clear. And in between them, yes. the uh, attacking. So, yes. And we also mentioned that you know, like, uh, things are between the forbidden and commanded. So, how can we. No, this is, this is different. It's different yeah? These are the things which are not entirely clear to the point that it is not very clear with where, it, with where it is. Is it halal or haram? So in these cases, the uh, best thing to do is to avoid them. This is something else. This is the matters which are not entirely clear, in which one uh, could not reach to a clear ruling regarding regarding this. Okay. You have some examples. Yeah, some examples. You can say in yourself things. There are things that have not become entirely clear to you, even if you're asking a lot about them, and some, some say, for example, no, you can do it, and some say you cannot. So that thing, if it did not become clear to you, then the best thing for you to do, the best thing to your religion is to do is to what? To avoid it. But I don't have a, a certain uh, example that I can give you right now. صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى آله وصحبه